Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the freedom we have to enter into this building and to worship and praise and pray together. Thank you for the family ties that are present here in this church as well. And even, Lord, as we listen to your word this morning, we pray that your spirit will speak into our hearts, into our world, helping us to obtain and understand the essence of the message that you have given. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I'm reading Luke chapter 18 and verse 35. And the scriptures read, As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Most likely this man's living place was outside the city walls because he was an outcast, considered an outcast. Mark identifies this man as Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. And he's there on the streets, out in the elements, begging from passers-by. Verse 36 now, hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this it was. He hears people, and he begins his routine of begging. But he notices the voices are not of the ordinary crowd that passes him daily. There are considerably more people passing by. He can deduce this from the amount of shuffling feet that, feet that he may hear or catch tidbits of various conversations. And his curiosity is, is sparked. And he asks what this was. Church family, I believe similar questions are asked by people who may come to your church and witness the ministries that you do in this community. Now, I don't know what they may all be, but whatever it is you're doing, people are asking questions, be it through a food distribution ministry, or vacation Bible school, or health clinics, dinner with the doctor, community cleanups, visits to nursing homes, visits to shut-ins and incarcerated, and the incarcerated, maybe volunteering at local schools, whatever it is you do, as the community around this church witnesses and hears about your action, maybe they are beginning to ask, what is this? What's happening here? Why are they doing these things? A question for you to ponder this morning is, does your community around you, do they see? Do they hear? Do they experience what you are doing for others? How are you impacting the surrounding community. Verse 37, they told Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus as some people pronounce it, that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, that Jesus 
was passing by. That is the reason for all the commotion. Now, Bartimaeus must have heard some good things about Jesus and the for wonderful things that he does forever for others. I mean, he was not just there and just heard about Jesus, but he knew something about Jesus. And he realizes that maybe this was his moment to have an encounter with the Lord. Church, your involvement in this local community is so important. It's so important that you're out, that you're meeting, that you're talking to people, that you're sharing the good news of the gospel. Because for many people in this community, your actions, the things that you do, are indicators that Jesus still walks the streets. That Jesus is still out there looking, serving, talking, healing, and touching the lives of people. People encounter him. They encounter him, listen to this, they encounter him today through your ministries and your acts of kindness. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. We all, every one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, we all comprise the body of Christ. And we allow Jesus to love others from all walks of life through us in the ministries that we provide. Amen? Amen? Jesus works, speaks, lives, touches other lives through you and through me. Amen. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? You may say, I'm just a nobody. I don't have much of anything to give to other people. But Jesus sees it different. You know, I used to think, you know, I heard one person giving a, a testimony one day about how they were spreading the love of Jesus. And they said something as simple as this. They said, when I get on the elevator, this is before we started wearing masks, he said, I would get in the elevator with strangers and I would just smile at people. And sometimes people would say, why are you so happy? And that was my, that was my chance to tell them why. You know, I believe that Jesus is, is in my heart. I believe that my life is secure in him. And so I'm thinking, I'm listening, I'm saying, that's pretty neat. Well, guess what I did, church family? I started smiling in the elevators. <laughs> and you'll be amazed how people respond to that. Because people, their minds are elsewhere. They're thinking about all the stuff that's on their plate, things that are depressing sometimes. And then they get on the elevator, and through a simple smile, they can receive hope. Therefore, the, question, the answer to the question, what is this? What's going on? Asked by the blind man. And why are you doing this? Asked by those who may encounter your ministries in this community. They might be this. Your answer might be this. We're doing these things because we're sharing the love of Jesus Christ. That's why we do what we do. We're sharing the love of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm almost tempted to ask a question because you're here, but... I almost want to ask the question, are you doing much in this community? Are you reaching out to the community? Are you doing things not necessarily that brings the community here all the time, but are you doing things that take you out in the community to connect with people? If you're not doing that, you need to begin to have those conversations because this is why we're here. This is how the gospel message will be proclaimed to all the world. And then the end will come. Amen? Amen. 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 I, like what, um, I like what Edgar Guess wrote. He wrote a poem voicing an adage well used by others. And I didn't know that. And I was just kind of, you know, looking around and listen to this poem. You, you'll know the part that, that you hear a lot. This is just part of his poem. He says, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Now, you've heard that, right? Yeah. And I don't know if, he, if, if it originated with him, but he made a whole poem around it. I'm just going to read part of it. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. 
I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil, more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but example is always clear. All the best of, and the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see a good, for to see a good put in action is what everybody needs. I can soon learn how to do it if you will let me see it done. Hello. I can watch your hand in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lectures you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I, am, for I may misunderstand you in the high advice you give, but there is no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? People are moved by our actions. They're moved by our compassion ministries because by so doing, we're putting action to the truth of God's word. We are living out what we proclaim. Amen. If you're with me this morning, let me hear you say, Amen. 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 Verse 38. And Bartimaeus, he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You know, that word mercy is a wide, all-embracing plea for help, meaning the need could be just about anything. Have mercy on me. Mercy. Show me kindness. Show concern for me, for I am in serious need. That was Bartimaeus' plea. Have mercy on me. Does this community see you, this church, as a place of compassion, as a place of hope, as a place of love? I hope your answer to that question is yes. But if your answer to that question is maybe or I don't know, another question I want to throw out to you is what are you going to do about it? Sometimes churches depend upon pastors to lead and implement all these types of things, and pastors should. But if, by chance, your pastor is not, I want to encourage you. Like, um, what was the man who stood up and, and instituted the work be? Yeah, Bo, I don't see him here. But maybe one of you should do the same. And say, let's start impacting our community. Right, sister? Amen. Wouldn't it be great if people could call out to this church or call out to you personally because they know that when they're in need, they can depend upon you to have compassion, to show consideration, to care, to have mercy on them. Wouldn't that be great? I don't know, but those folk over there, that Rome Seven Adventist Church, those are some good people. You need some help, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna take care of you. And it's not always about having money to give out because sometimes people need more advice than they do money. Amen. Hello. Amen. And, of course, this won't happen overnight but that reputation can be established over time. Those are good people there. You know, they may not have much, but they will, they will feed you. They will make sure that you can get what you need. My uh, former neighbor, he lived next to me, or I moved in, and uh, we became good friends over the past eight years. He just recently moved away. He's a well-known person in the community. He's a lawyer. So he gets around, he's connected with all these different groups of people. And um, one day he was 
driving his car and he was distracted and he ran off the road, tore this thing up. And um, he called me. And he says, I know you're extremely busy and this might not be the right time, but I can't think of anyone else to call who I know will make an effort to come besides you. And all I could say was glory to God for the show of mercy. For this guy saw something in me that I wasn't looking. I'm, you know, I'm not trying to aim at this. But he saw God's mercy in how I've related to him throughout the years. People know where they can get help. People should know where they can go for genu genuine assistance. People know where people are real and will care about them. Let's make that the reputation for this church. Amen. What do you say? Amen. Verse 39. Those who led the way were sternly telling him Bartimaeus to be quiet but he kept crying out all the more son of David have mercy on me to many in the crowd this man was just a beggar just a stranger an outcast doing what outcasts tend to do someone not worthy of the master's time be quiet Bartimaeus but his plea was to have an audience with the master. Son of David, have mercy on me. In today's world, we encounter people who may not be audibly crying out, have mercy. But nevertheless, theirs is a silent plea whose lives and the things that they face and deal with, whether that's sickness, whether that's loss, or depression, or loneliness, and rejection, or concern for others, many whose lives may be on a treadmill going nowhere. Theirs is a silent cry, a silent plea for mercy. And yet in their pain the world seems to shout back at them be quiet why don't you drown your sorrows by buying this product by subscri subscribing to this by indulging in that and consuming this all manufactured answers to people's problems and yes someone does get rich off of it don't they but none of it has the long-lasting effects that people are standing in need of. I believe Bartimaeus tried everything that he could to regain his sight. Yeah, he went through the process. He tried the eye salve product that Laodicea was known for in those days. He probably received care from some of the same physicians who treated the woman with the issue of blood with no improvement. He tried it all, but nothing worked. He desired an audience with the master. Verse 40, and Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned them. I love that part. Jesus stopped for this beggar. Everybody telling him to shut up. But Jesus took notice. And he stopped. I'm a firm believer that people just don't walk into a Seventh-day Adventist church or stop by one of our food banks, 
or fill out a Bible study request form or whatever you have going on. I don't think that they do that on their own. I believe the spirit of Jesus calls them and moves them. And I am glad to hear that you are involved in the conference leads program. That you are working, some of you are working with leads that are coming in as a result of that program. Working, giving Bible studies. Because there are people who are becoming in-person members of our church through those virtual Bible studies. And I don't believe that those folk responded to the ads because they just said, I need something different in my life. I believe Jesus led them. Amen. He called them. And as believers, bearers of the truth, I believe the people that you and I encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, those we bump into when we're running our task, moving about trying to get ready for the Sabbath, when we go to the post office, or when we shop at my favorite store, Home Depot, and I have to go in there without a wallet in order to keep from buying everything, or when a repair person enters our home, or the teller at the bank, or the cashier at the grocery store. I believe that Jesus has a way of setting up what should be viewed as divine encounters to perform divine interventions, plant seeds, provide opportunities to witness verbally and through our acts of kindness in our lives as we live for Jesus Christ. I don't think that these things just happen by chance. I believe that God sets these things up and he accomplishes these things through you and I. So I challenge you. Don't take these common meetings for granted. Don't just brush them off and say, huh, that was nice, nice person. But see them for what they are, an opportunity to be the hands, the feet, the mouth, the ears of the master passing by. Because God hears the silent plea of every heart. And he seeks to answer, to give hope through your acts of kindness and your God-inspired words of comfort, encouragement, and at times acclamations or, or, or proclamation. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Because God impresses upon them a need for something that wealth and materialism and relationships an addiction cannot fulfill. They need something more. Theirs is a silent plea. And in verse 31, Jesus asked Bartimaeus a very important question. Verse 41. What do you want me to do for you? That's a powerful question, isn't it? What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. Verse 42, and Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has done what? Made you well. I like the story of the paraplegic whose friends tore away a roof to lure him into the presence of Jesus. Like Bartimaeus' blindness, it's obvious that this paraplegic wants to be made whole. But Jesus at that moment overlooked what was very obvious. And he touches the man's deepest need by saying to him, do you remember what Jesus said to the paraplegic? He says, your sins are forgiven you your past failures, your shortcomings of the present, and the mistakes you will make. The impact of sin is removed. No, the impact of sin has been atoned for through the blood of Jesus. 
This was the man's silent plea. And it was the plea that only Jesus could do by washing away the contamination of sin and law that sin brings. Folk, Jesus is the ultimate answer to anyone's plea. He is the ultimate. And yes, Bartimaeus obviously needed to regain his sight, but the cry of mercy covers much more than the obvious. Have mercy is a plea that has the potential to deal with the person's total situation. All that they are, all that they're dealing with, all of their concerns. Rome, yes, people need to hear the truth. But alongside of that, and more than that, they need to know the God of truth. Jesus and the depths of the love that he has for all and the bountiful mercy he is willing to bestow. So one last part to this sermon, very small. I want to throw at you and then we're going to have prayer so you can go home. As you read this verse, imagine Jesus asking you that question. What do you want me to do for you personally? What do you want him to do for you? Beyond your obvious needs, what do you desire for him to do for you or your loved ones? You know, many times this is a difficult question to answer because we don't know. We just want God to do what he does because he tends to know best for us, doesn't he? My prayer is this, that God will help us. He will open up our eyes. He will give us the vision to see people the way that he sees people. To love people the way he loves people. To encounter people the way that he wants us to encounter people. To give him the opportunity to love, to live, to come alongside of folk, to encourage them, to cheer them on, to support him the way that he wants to support them through you and I. Lord Jesus, help us to see. Andy Stanley is a well-known speaker and, and leader. And uh, here's the gist of something that he says a lot. I think you're going to like this. I'm going to close with this. In speaking of the church services and all the outreach programs that he does, you know, people are always praising, you know, his churches, his network of churches for all these things. But this is what he says. He says, we're not here to try and change people. We're not here to try to change the way they dress or change their lifestyles and habits. But through our church services and our outreach efforts, we're merely setting them up for dates with Jesus so that they might come to know him better and possibly fall in love with him. I believe this should be our goal in our proclamation of the three angels' message and the goal of our acts of kindness and the way we live personally and the way we help and the way we give hope and the way we engage with the people in this community. We are to set up dates for them to get to know Jesus better. Amen? Amen? Verse 43, immediately he regained his sight and began following Jesus, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they praised, they gave praise to God. May this be the result of your ministry. You're intentionally setting up dates with Jesus. People deciding making decisions to follow Jesus Christ.
People living lives that glorify God. People looking on and desiring to know and praise the God of love right here in Rome, Georgia. In Jesus' name, amen.